Hi, I'm Jeff Thorman from Home Renovation DIY, and today's video is kind of special. It is an A to Z, all things carpentry. We are going to be covering filler strips, toe kicks, how to trim out old windows and make custom sills. We're going to be talking about baseboards and quarter round and shoe mold and door casings. We're going to be talking about how to um, build your own island and, and finish it off with a really custom wood on the back side. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous barn board. We're going to show you how to do crown molding and build everything custom that you need to make your renovation an absolute success. So stay with us, get comfortable. We got a lot of information to get through because listen, here at our channel, we're here to help. So we're going to help you become the best carpenter you can be with some of the simplest tools. Today we are talking about finishing trim work. Now we are going to be doing this whole series on DIY finished carpentry because here on this channel we've done a lot of different things we've shown you how to paint how to drywall how to do flooring all just about everything but when it comes to the finished carpentry we realize that we've come a little bit short on giving you a broad scope of knowledge so that you can do all your finished carpentry and have it look perfect every time I'm going to share with you a great DIY homeowner secret a nice process so that you can get a great finish and you're not going to go doing a lot of rework and touch-ups and making messes as you go. So today is gonna to be a process. We're gonna be doing baseboards. We're gonna be doing door and window casings. So let's get right into this. We're gonna talk about the product first. You have basically two choices when you're gonna be buying trim for your house and that is the medium density fiber or you can get solid wood. Now, medium density fiber used to have a benefit because it was cheaper, but now it seems to be running about the same kind of cost. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that if you're going to buy trim, go get wood. And if you want a shopping secret, don't buy it at the box store. Their markup is ridiculous. Go online and find a local trim supplier in the area. Uh, you can just Google trim carpentry supplier. Uh, in Ottawa, we have a company that's just across the street. I first found them because they opened up literally across the street from a Home Depot. And I saw the truck from Alexand Alexandria Moldings. Alexandria Moldings. I saw that truck roll into Home Depot one day and I went shopping and then after I saw it roll across the street to this other store. I had no idea who they were so I popped in to say hi. Turns out they sell their trim to anybody and you didn't have to be a part of their exclusive club. <laughs> it was also half the price, right? That's crazy. So I started buying really high quality three quarter inch trim, right? That was cheaper than the economy trim at the Home Depot. Just saying, uh, shouldn't be a big surprise. For Home Depot to be handling trim, it's real labor expensive. I mean, like they put it on this huge skid, they have to roll this cart through and they got guys standing there loading a few pieces of every kind of trim. It's ridiculous. When you go to this store, they bring it, the truck drops it, and they just roll it right into the bay. It's more of a warehouse effect where Home Depot is more of a retail look. I know they're supposed to act like a warehouse, but they don't operate like a warehouse and it makes it very, very expensive. So. Find yourself a good deal on your trim. Buy the highest quality that you can find because one of the measures when people are looking at your house if you're gonna sell is the trim work, all right? If you have the same cheap economy trim as everyone else, it always looks flat and boring and it doesn't give you the options for making that pop on the wall. When you use something like this as a baseboard and it's three quarter inch thick, that means the casings are also three quarter inch thick. There's, there's, there's like a 3D look, right? It pops off the wall and you get nice shadowing effect. Anyway, worth the investment. So let's talk about what my program is. So there are different processes for installing and finishing off your trim, depending on what kind of situation you're in. If you're in an existing space and you want to change out old baseboards and casings and put new ones in, then I'm going to suggest that you follow this process. If you're in a new home construction environment where you're doing a brand new remodel and you have access to a paint sprayer, then I'm going to suggest you just install all the trim and then tape off your windows and use the paint sprayer to spray all your trim in place. Then you can cut and roll all your walls. But what I'm doing is I'm going to follow a simple program for people who don't have those high quality tools, okay? Because this is very helpful. What we're gonna do is actually paint all of our trim in advance. And then I'm gonna show you how to install it so that there's very minimal touch up work after the fact. Because if you can paint all your trim first and then put it in place, you're gonna save yourself a lot of crawling around and bending over, and it just makes the whole process a lot easier to deal with. So if I paint it first, I can put it in place, do some caulking, I'm gonna have a few nail holes to touch up, then it's just really quick and done, nice and easy. So I have got nice baseboard, 
It's a, I think they call it the Hopper series. I don't know if it's available where you are, but it's very cool. We also have some really thick casing. Now this is a three quarter inch profile as well, and it is really wide. It's three and three quarter inch. And I'm gonna use this around my windows on a tile wall to give it a real dramatic flare. Also got some nice one by five flat stock. This is very cool. It comes with a little bit of a rounded edge here. So this makes a really nice detail when you are running your casing up against it. And we're gonna combine that for our window jams. And then we're gonna add this as a window sill. Bam, all right. So we're gonna stick all that together to make our windows. And this will give us a nice little build out and extend our window jam into more of a ledge so that it functions. You can put your herb pots and stuff like that in the window in the kitchen. And then around our doors, we're doing the same three quarter, but it's only two and a half, same series. And this is because we don't want to have all of the doors with that huge trim. It takes away from the effect in the window and also makes it more convenient because we're going to have light switches around the room. So door jams on the interior that are too wide. You really need to plan in advance to move your light switches over. And we didn't do that. We went more of a standard install. So this is for that. What we're going to do is I'm just going to pull out my roller and I'm just using my mini roller today. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to use the mini roller. We're going to roll the trim, set it aside to dry. Once you roll the trim, it usually is about 20 to 30 minutes, and then it's ready to start cutting and installing. So we're just going to take a few minutes and get all this process done. I'm going to wear some gloves. There's not really a whole lot to this, except because of the detail, I'm going to roll it on a little thick, and then I'm going to drag my brush through it to make sure we don't have drips laying in all the edges. That'll keep the detail sharp, and then that's it. One of the downfalls of buying a gallon of trim paint is if it sits around for a few weeks, it separates. And I don't have a personal paint shaker sitting around at home, so this is basically all I can do. Ay, ay, ay. I just hate sitting there with a stir stick making a mess of everything. There we go. <sighs> Done. Okay, oh. I'm going to try to not get covered in paint today and use a couple of gloves. Learn from experience that when you're painting the trim, although you're only painting the top surface, you always get a little drip line around the edge because the profile is so sharp. And then when you pick it up to set it aside to dry, it always gets all over your hands. And I am just uh, loving the idea of keeping my hands clean. So instead of painting one board at a time, I'm just going to paint a whole section at a time. <laughs> Once this roller fills up with paint a little better, it'll work a lot nicer. Now, I'm more concerned about these thick sections. This joint here, this is the part of the trim that actually sits up against the flooring. That's the one that I don't want to ever have touch paint again. All right, so that's the one that I want to put a nice thick coat on because I'm only ever planning on putting one coat of paint there. The top part of the trim, I'm not too concerned about how perfect that detail is because that's where I'm going to be putting in some nails and that's also going to be where the caulking goes and I'm going to need to run the brush again on that later to get a really nice cut line. So just making sure that that thick section of the trim is done gives me an advantage Just run that through the detail so we don't get drips. Now this is not as fast as spraying the trim once it's in place, but it's a lot faster than just putting it on the wall and then crawling around brushing afterwards. And because we're getting a nice look right against that edge that goes on the floor. I'm never going to have to run my brush right up along that edge and try to cut it afterwards. And that will save me from having a lot of ugly mistakes later. All right, so while our trim is drying, we need a few more minutes before it's good. We're going to just we set up the bench to show you all the tools and stuff that we're going to be using in our carpentry video today. 
and possibly what you might need to be shopping for yourself. And we're going to go through how they all function so that when we're doing the application later on the wall, it makes a lot more sense for you. Okay, so first of all, unless you literally want to install all your trim with a hammer and nails, which is an option, you're going to need to buy one of these bad boys. Now, this Husky compressor, it's a pretty basic unit. It is, I use it for trim carpentry. You can also use it for hardwood flooring, but not for large spaces. It doesn't hold enough pressure and power to do a hardwood floor job start to finish without you constantly waiting for it to pressurize again. But for finish nailing, it is brilliant. It's on wheels and the front has rubber feet. So this is designed to be used inside a finished house for doing repairs and not gonna mark any floors or cause any scratches. That's an important consideration. I'm using a two inch brad nail system. I'm using an 18 gauge nailer for our trim. Um, you could use a 16 gauge for some of this application because the wood is so thick, but I found the versatility in an 18 gauge, if I'm gonna recommend to homeowners, get one tool, get one 18 gauge nailer. You can get nails that are one inch to two inches long, different variations, that's best for you. A two inch nail works really good for a three quarter inch wood, plus the thickness of your drywall. It still leaves you enough nail to get through the drywall and occasionally find some wood. It's really effective when you're pinning things together so I can connect my joints using these nails and then I'm set to go. You're also gonna need some glue because all of your outside corners and miter joints should be glued. It should be number one rule at doing finished carpentry, glue your joints, okay? If you're not gluing your joints, you're guaranteeing that those joints are gonna crack and crack joints always look like garbage and means callbacks and more, more work in the future. So avoid that and use the glue. Uh, depending on your compressor and the tool that you buy, you might need oil. Okay, and the way that that works is you can just put it in the back of the gun. Um, this particular gun that I have here from DeWalt doesn't require oil, but let me just show you. There's my gun there, okay? If this required oil, it'll say so in the package, and you just flip the nozzle up and you can throw a couple of drips in there. Do that every 30 minutes to an hour to avoid your gun jamming on you. But like I said, paid a little extra for a gun that I don't need to do that for. Well, now that we're here, we'll just talk about the gun. So this gun is awesome. It has depth setting dial on it, okay? So if the nails in the gun are sticking out in whatever wood you're working with, you can adjust that. If you're going to a soft wood from a hard wood, you can back it out so that you're not driving the nail too deep. It also has a nice little waist clip here so it can sit on the belt. And any other considerations here? Oh yeah. The little yellow rubber tip on the end there, that's awesome because you have to compress the nailer in order to fire it, all right? And that little rubber tip down there keeps you from marking the wood when you're putting your pressure on. Other than that, here, let me get rid of that case. The functionality is simple, it has a release, all right? And your nails can just be loaded in off the side. Knowing how to function that is really handy. The compressor hose that ties all this together. I always go out and I buy one of these 25 foot rubber ones because they don't kink, okay? And they always come back to normal. You're gonna find that if you buy a cheaper plastic hose, it'll just be a mess and you spend your whole day trying to undo the kinks in the hose. You just pull down this click lock system, okay? You're good to go. When you're all done, you can just pull down and release the tool. And of course, if you're gonna be using air tools, I know, but this is one time it's important. The brad nail is a very unique tool because it's firing a nail under an incredible amount of velocity. And sometimes when it hits an object, or if you accidentally fire, it'll deflect. And so it's good to have these on. Uh, they don't do a lot of damage if you're not really close to it. Like I can stand here and shoot Max with the gun all day long and he's gonna get a few pin breaks, but that'll be about it. But it's good to wear the glasses. This tool here, I'm gonna demonstrate later because we have an existing door that we pulled the trim off to start the renovation and there are brad nails left in the jam. And so this is a great tool. I use this to pinch my heads and then I rock to pull the nails out. You'll see that demonstrated later. That's worth gold. Good to have a drill. Construction screws. Uh, we're gonna be building our own windowsill because the depth is so thick. I couldn't just buy a stock windowsill. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna glue the sill to the jam and then we're gonna add construction screws. So always good to have that handy. 
gives you lots of options. Now, once we've got all the trim on the wall, we have to patch our holes. And so, Hawk, four inch knife, and you guessed it, I love my Sheetrock 45. This is a perfect application for this. You can mix that pretty silky smooth, and then you can just use your thumb and press it into all the holes, because a good carpenter will always fill their own nail holes. All right, if you're on a job somewhere and the carpenter installed all of his trim and he didn't finish his nails, he did not finish his job. <laughs> Shout out to all the guys who are cutting corners out there. If you're gonna nail something on the wall and you're not gonna finish your hole, you don't deserve to get paid. Go fill your holes. It's not the painter's job to clean up after your mess. Now, <laughs> gonna get some hate for that one, but that's all right. The other thing you're gonna need is some caulking so that you can do all your joints from your one surface to the wall and even your inside joints. Nice to clean it up with a little bit of finished caulking. This particular product is necessary, okay? This product is called windows and doors, okay? Don't use the general purpose caulking. Now, here's the deal about caulking, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit because the quality of your finish depends on the quality of the products you're using. If you use the general purpose caulking, yes, it dries quick, it's like 20 minutes, but it does not have any elastomeric property whatsoever, and during any expansion contraction cycle, it's gonna crack. All right, so don't use that junk, use this. Yes, it takes about two hours to actually set up properly before you paint, but it's worth the investment. And if you're doing any kind of trim work, trust me, you've got the time to let this dry. Put your stuff on the wall, do the caulking first before you fill your nail holes. And by the time you're done filling your nail holes with your Sheetrock 45, you'll be able to sand all your nail holes because it'll be dry really quick. And then by the time you're all done that, this will be ready for you to paint, okay? So don't get your knickers in a knot. Feel free to use a quality product, even if it takes longer to dry. And if you're in a real big hurry, you can buy a quick dry product that is elastomeric. It's a little more expensive and it's difficult to work with, but it's an option. Latex acrylic caulking, you just snip the tip and then you're good to go. You don't have to puncture a hole. So don't waste your time and you can make this really tiny. So when you're doing finishing work, if the wood is nice and tight to your wall, you don't need a lot of bead, okay? Because the expansion rate is like two to 300%. So you can actually get away with a real thin bead. It doesn't have to be obnoxious. All right, so cut your hole small. And then when you're done, you can put tape on it and it'll be ready to use the next time. Because you're using 45 minute mud, you're gonna need a little sanding sponge so you can take off your rough edges. And of course, I know it's not part of finished carpentry as far as a trade is concerned, but since I'm talking to you, the homeowner, you guys are gonna to wanna to know how to finish the entire project. Here's my tips here. Have a little kills, all right? When you're going through your wood and you're ready to paint it, if you see any of that uh, finger joint section of the, of the primed wood that's a little yellow, hit it with the oil-based primer first, set it aside until it's dry before you paint it, all right? Always good to have a couple of rags because if you're dirty, then everything you touch is gonna get dirty. Uh, just good to have that going on. Get a nice three-inch brush. A stiff brush is best. No, that's not a joke. A stiff brush for trim work is better than the regular purpose one used for a wall. But if you are good enough to get away with it, a, one brush does everything. It's generally recommended to use a stiff bristle brush for doing trim because most paint will, when you paint it, will drag on the trim and leave lines. But if you're using a good quality acrylic paint, okay, then you wanna paint from the top down, always dragging in the direction of gravity and you'll be fine. If you're using oil, Start from the bottom and paint up. That's the simple rule, and that'll help you out. Because your trim paint is gonna come in either a small cork, and you can't get a brush in it, or it's gonna come in a gallon, it's too much paint to work with, having a handy pail now makes perfect sense, because you can add just a little bit of paint, and you can put your brush on that magnet, and it'll keep it out of the paint so it's not soaking up into the bristles while you're working. Okay, the only other thing I think I wanted to mention was the option some nitrile gloves, right? When you're working with all your finished trim, wear the gloves. Usually when you're in a finished trim, if you're renovating your own house, you could be in a finished space. If you're gonna get paint all over yourself, get it on the gloves. You can take the gloves off when you're done and you're not gonna make a mess somewhere by accident. Finally, my laser level. I know, I'm gonna mention this one more time. We're gonna be building uh, window jams. Now our windows are in level, but in order to put the jams in, we're gonna build it all first and then set it in place. I like to just throw this up to have a laser line where I want it finished so that I have a reference point. So when I'm nailing and shimming, it makes my life simple. I don't have to constantly be grabbing levels and checking out all the surfaces for plumb and flush. 
drop one laser line on the side of the window where the jam goes and you can get that installed real easy. You're going to see all of this in the video. Now let's get into installing this stuff because now the trim is dry, we're good to go. All right, so if you're a homeowner and you're looking for a tool investment, uh, understand that setting up your finished carpentry can be expensive, but it doesn't have to be. The compressor nailer that I use, you can usually get in a combination for around $200. This saw right here, I think it also was about two to 250. That's in Canadian dollars, so I know you can get a better deal. This is just a basic 10 inch compound miter saw. It does not have a slide, it's not a 12 inch blade. Everything I cut, I've got to loosen up my wheel and tilt over and cut my miters on that angle. The beautiful thing about this is it's set at 45 degrees as a default, so it makes my life simple when I want to cut trim. Now, because my baseboards are so tall, I've got to lay them flat and cut my miters on the side. We'll show you how to do that in a minute. The only other thing you need to know about this is it has a release mechanism underneath here so that I can move my table and I have my gauges for my angles here. For today's video, we are going to oversimplify everything and only cut 45 degree angles. That means when you add two 45s together, it makes 90 degrees. So that's all of your miter cuts around the doors. It's also all of the inside and outside corners on every wall. If the walls are not perfect 90s, as a homeowner doing finishing trim, I'm gonna show you secrets and tips that you can use to keep your saw skills to a minimum. And then you do the install, it's still gonna look perfect, okay? So bear with me, let's get into this. First thing we gotta do is start measuring. So I've got my tape measure and my pencil. Hmm, pretty, pretty, pretty. I'm gonna be handing these out. We're gonna be going on our tour in just a few weeks, so make sure you check out our webpage, look at the event schedule. All right, check out to see when we're gonna be in an area near you and click on an event that you wanna to get to and fill all that information out. We look forward to seeing you live in your city soon. So my process for doing finished trim in a room is first you wanna do all your door casing, then you wanna do your baseboards and then window casing. Um, the windows you can do in any order, but you can't put your baseboards in until your door casings are on. That's kind of a given. So like I mentioned before, this is an, a previous door and I'm, I had a casing installed that using the two inch nails that we're gonna be using. I'll throw that over there. And these pliers are amazing because you can remove the nail without just pinching off the head. Moderate amount of pressure just to hold it snug and it'll release. And you can just roll it off. Now the design on this pair of pliers here for nail removal is that even up against softwood lumber, if you make a mistake, you don't have your air pressure set right and your nail doesn't drive all the way in, you can sit this on your soft pine, pull your nails with that rocking motion, okay? And it's not going to dent the wood, so. This is why I love having these in my toolbox. They are a lifesaver whenever you make a mistake, and you will. We all do. <laughs> That's normal. All right. All right. There's a delicate balance there between cutting it and pulling it, let me tell you. Whoops. Balance not achieved. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you my basic system for installing a door casing, and that is this. Set your window trim in behind the hinge, and you wanna be consistent. And the idea here is you put your pencil there and mark your trim. All right, you can see that, okay? There's your mark, and then on the face of this, draw a line somewhat of a 45 degree to that intersection point. And make that real obvious. That's all the information you need to go to the saw to cut. But in this situation, we're dealing with new construction. We don't have flooring yet. So you have two choices. You can set it on the subfloor, and then later you can take out a jam saw and cut the trims down. Or if you followed my advice and you have everything on site because you've done your shopping already, you bring out the under pad and the flooring that you're gonna be using, and you lay it in place. And you can set the height of the finished floor in front of your door, bam. Now you can put your casing right on that flooring. What this will do is pr provide you the perfect gap for later when you go to install your floor, you can slide it right underneath. Now when we're installing the floor in this room, I'm actually starting on this door and heading in that direction. So I don't have any concerns about doing this right now. It's a great little cheat, but look how much my cut line has changed. 
It's almost three eighths of an inch difference. Okay, that's awesome. And now I've also saved myself about five or 10 minutes per casing of fussing around with that little jam saw. <laughs> now, the other side, we're gonna set that up as well. There's my line. I'm gonna just trace that out on the trim, put my mark, boom. Now I'm gonna go with the saw. We're gonna get those cut. All right, so just a quick note, if you have any questions or comments about the tool selection we're using, make sure you put it in the comment section. I do check these comments every morning and every night. I may not have a chance to respond to all of them, but I will read them all. And if you are a member, I guarantee to respond to your questions. So feel free to ask as many as you like. Now, let's go take a look at this. Here's our trim. Now the saw, of course, we're just gonna set 45 degrees. Now you see these notches, right? These notches are predetermined places where this, the saw will set up. So there's one set at 45, and so you can be confident when you get there that it's the right angle. Now, before you get started, you wanna get familiar with your saw. You wanna take a look at the material that you're cutting out, and where the blade is. So the blade is actually gonna finish here about an eighth of an inch from the yellow side. So when I slide this over here, I'm gonna put my pencil line right on that mark and then I'm going to cut twice. <laughs> Measure once and cut twice. I know it's contrary to what most people do, but watch what I do here. You see, I just started my line, and now I know where that blade's gonna go. I can slide this into position. Perfect every time. Now for the other side of the casing, and you know what, just, just for the heck of it, if you find that it makes it easier for you so that you're not confused, when you're making your mark, Put a whole line on that, okay? You can draw the whole relative angle just so you know which way your saw blade needs to be set. You don't ever get confused. Nothing worse than cutting something the wrong angle and then it's garbage because it's too short. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna do a primary line. And you can do this over and over and over again as many times as necessary. And I use my thumb against the edge here and I can actually feed the trim without moving my arm. So I'm never in any risk of cutting myself. And you can see there's my cut right on that pencil mark. Perfect. I was just taking a couple shots at Max here. <laughs> ah, that's funny. I was just reminding Max of a story when I was working on a job. We had a guy that did deliveries for us. His name was Bob. And uh, every time Bob would show up, the guys would all turn around with our guns and take the safety off. We'd pull the, pull the trigger back. And then when Bob would come up, we'd all turn around and <laughs> unload brad nails on him. <laughs> Not the most responsible thing to do, but man, was it ever fun. Uh, you'd see them, we'd be 20, 30 feet away and the nails would all come firing out. They all turned sideways and they finished the rest of the trip sideways. It was the weirdest thing. Every once in a while, we'd poke a little hole in them, but uh, he was wearing glasses. <laughs> Anyway, the next step in putting in your trim, uh, don't put tight up against your hinges. That's a mistake a lot of people make. Um, there's one stationary and one moving element of the hinge. So if you're tight up against the hinge, you're gonna get squeaks. Take it a sixteenth of an inch off. Just make sure there's no contact there. All right? And then about there. Throw that into the jam. Now it's installed. Come down to the next one. Now wood is tricky because sometimes it can be curved, right? So you wanna make sure you're on the hinge and then let it off a little bit. Fire that nail into the jam behind it. Remember, the jam material itself is 5 eighths of an inch thick, okay? So it's thicker than this, right? The idea here is you're attaching this piece of wood to the door jam not the wall or the wall framing at this point. Okay, we get down here, same thing, push and then pull it off a little bit. Now, the reason I'm always setting this pin above the hinge is I don't want this nail to hit one of the screws that the hinge is using. If it does that, it won't go all the way in and then you're gonna have an ugly spot there trying to repair next to a hinge and you won't have access to it. So I always shoot just a little bit above. Three nails is all you need. Now you can check your gaps here. My wall is sort of straight, but that's fine. Leave it alone for now, because one side fixed. Now we come over here, and we're going to set this on our mark that we wanted for that, right? 
Remember I put a pencil line there? I'm going to shoot about a foot and a half away. And I'm only throwing in two nails this time. And here's why. When I'm cutting my top, I'm going to be cutting the length from the two miters. And I want this to have a little flexibility to move left or right to close the gaps and make it perfect. Okay? So if you set your nails a little bit lower, you'll have a little bit of flexibility. We're talking a sixteenth of an inch, but that little bit of flexibility makes the joint perfect. So, now what we do, is we're going to measure from the outside to the outside. Okay? And in this case, it's 37 and a quarter. That's perfect. So let's go back to the saw, and I'll show you how to set that piece. Take a scrap piece of your lumber material, and when you take a measurement, write it down. The number one waste of time on a job site when you're doing finished carpentry is not writing down your numbers, and I'll tell you why. As soon as you do that, you come over here, oh, you got to adjust your saw, or the phone rings, somebody calls, uh, somebody walks in the room, asks you a question, uh, you just generally get distracted with whatever. You forget your number. Now you're right back to measuring again. Don't waste your time. Always write it down. And then I can keep that whole list going all day long. No big deal. And 37 and a quarter is right here. Now on this tape, it actually tells me. <laughs> if you're new to measuring, you're going to want to get a tape that has these numbers. Now this is a DeWalt tape measure, 25 foot, okay? It actually tells you what inch and what every different measurement is on the tape. It's a bit of a cheat, but if you're new to this and you're not sure and you're communicating with other people, knowing exactly what you're cutting is important. Now, I'm going to make the mark a little bit bigger than 30, sorry, 37 and a quarter. Wow. One of those days already. And I'll show you why. First, we're going to cut the right length. Okay. Now, I'm already longer than I need to be. This is 37 and 3 eighths and a bit. And here's why. I would rather cut this a little bit too long, all right, and then come back here and take another blade, another saw blade thickness off, than try to make it perfect the first time and get this miter here wrong. Because what we're going to do is we're going to cut both miters now. Same thing. Set your saw blade, make your first cut, check to see how far you are from the corner, slide it over, and again. check it again, <laughs> make minor adjustments, here we go, now, obviously this is taking a minute to walk you through the process, but there is a perfect corner, and the way you check is you look at the end, and you see if there's any flat section, and this one has just a little bit, so we're going to take off another part of a blade, and the way I do that is I slide the trim into the blade, lift the blade, and then I cut, because when I went into the blade, I pushed the blade a little bit. So when I lift it up, it kind of reset, and it cut me just a hair. The other side, we'll cut the other way, get locked on your 45. I can run my pencil off the edge, so I have this little black line showing, and then I'm going to just do this as a bit of a guide. Okay. Blade. I already know this piece is going to be too long. It's going to be 37 and 3 eighths, and it is because I cut it perfect. So I'm going to actually, I'm just going to cut it down. I'm going to cut it the right length just by setting the blade there, sliding it over. I'm going to cut a blade length off. Okay, the point of measuring and cutting long on purpose is it's always easier to take a little bit off when you're done <laughs> in case you make a mistake while you're cutting. So now we're going to just put it in place and double check to see how it looks, right? Okay, so here we go. That's the right spot. I'm going to just open this side up just a touch. So it's going to be fine. Remember our goal here. Just glue the joints, nail the joints, and then attach it to the wall to level everything off. And I'll show you that process now. All right, so we're not needing a whole lot of this, right? Boom. Just run a little bit of a bead. There we go. Now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to shoot a nail through the side of the first trim into the new trim. 
and that'll bond all that together. And I'm going to put on a slight angle towards the back so the nail doesn't come out through the face. Okay, same over here. There we go, I like that. Okay, now, I have a bit of a curve in this wall. You'll see that? So if I nail that one tight into the stud behind it, it'll be perfect. So I'm going to set the nail right in this groove, not in the flat section. All right, that worked that well. And over here, yeah, same thing. Okay, and then just a couple into the jam. Boom, perfect. Now all we gotta do is throw a couple at the bottom, make sure everything's nice and tight to the wall. So these are going into the jam. And we go. And now all we have left is the side of the trim. And if we can close that up, that's great. Now, Behind the jam, there's usually a small space and then there's wood. But you don't want to nail through the face of the wood. So always find this detail, throw your nails there. Okay, that makes it a lot easier to patch up and a lot harder to see after the fact. I'm gonna do that over here as well. Beautiful. That's enough nails for now. Now we're going to go work on the baseboard. All right, so we're going to be measuring all of the baseboard. I like to measure four, five, 10, 50 pieces at a time. It doesn't really matter because this system allows you to measure and cut everything first and then assemble it and then install it. But one thing about this wall is we're getting a tile. And so I have to consider the thickness of this tile and the adhesive that goes behind it. So I'm going to take a half an inch off of this measurement so that I can put the tile, let's presume that that's my finished wood. I can actually tile this wall and slide the tile in behind the wood. I know that this tape is a little bit old, but most tape measures come with a measurement on the back of the tape. And that's the measurement from the heel to the front. All right, so when you're measuring, you can actually measure a space this, okay? So that's my measurement. My measurement is actually six feet plus the three and a quarter inches of the tape itself. So it's six, foot three and a quarter. Okay, so in inches, that ends up being 72 plus three and a quarter, 75 and a quarter, but we're gonna take off a half an inch. So my measurement is 74 and three quarters. And this is where this gets interesting. I have a system that I developed that I'm gonna let you use, and that's this. Since we're gonna cut everything at 45, assuming the corners are 90s, you have really only three marks here. So this is the length of the board and that represents physically a board. And on this side, it's a straight cut. On this side, it's a straight cut. It could be an outside or an inside corner. And I just make all these marks. So I'm gonna run around the room, take all my measurements, and then mark this template here with whether it's an outside or an inside 45 cut. That's all I need to know. Then I can go to the saw, knock all those pieces off, and then I can glue it all together, nail it all together, and then slide it in place. I'll show you how this works. So here's how I do this. Take my measuring board, and we'll call it that for now. And this first piece has a straight cut and then an inside miter joint because the, the line will be like this. That's an inside line. So I mark inside joint. The next piece on the left side is gonna be an inside joint. And over here, it's gonna be an outside miter. All right, and then after that, the next piece is gonna be this and then that. So now all I do is measure the three pieces. Nice and simple. Again, you can measure both directions. You can just go like this, read your tape. Now that says 20 and three quarters is tight. Five eighths was actually gonna be perfect because when you're measuring into a corner, you wanna go a little bit short on purpose. It's easier to finish and fix all this with the caulking after the fact than to try to force it all in place and then you'll end up cracking your joint on your drywall. So we'll go 20 and 5 eighths. Okay, and this one, we're gonna take the actual measurement, 35 and a half, because I want a 35 and a half to be coming out of that corner just a little bit. I'm fine if it comes a little bit past that corner. Again, I'm gonna install the trim first, lay it in position, and then we can caulk the gaps. 
So let's get that measurement one more time because I broke my own rule and I never wrote it down. 35 and a half. And then this wall, we're going to cut four and seven eighths just a little bit more. Would make me feel better. So if you want to get really specific, you can go four seven eighths and you can actually put L for long. And you can cut in between four and seven eighths and five inch. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Let's go to the saw. So we'll start with the first cut is the simplest. It's just a straight cut 74 and three quarters. I'm going to measure that and put a mark right there. Okay. Now, we also have a short one. And whenever I have a short one with inside and outside corners that I'm going to be doing on the flat, I like to cut them first. Because that way I can hold my wood in place far away from where the saw is going to be. So, 20 and 5 eighths. Wow, that is not going to be big enough. 4 and 7 eighths. Yep. So I've got one that's 4 and 7 eighths here. Long, right? Now, if you were to look at this, remember that's the end of the wall. So this board is actually going to be like that and like that. Something along that line, right? So what we want to do is we want to put this side on first. It doesn't have to be perfect. We'll set this up. Make sure your trim is against your fence. That holds it square to the blade. Start the blade and then once the machine is running, then you can make your cut. All right, now, if you want to have nice looking trim and you want to be safe, use a really sharp blade. <laughs> the duller the blade, the more likely you are to have an accident. Now, we can take our measurement to four and seven eighths long, right here. We call that 15 sixteenths, but it doesn't actually get written on the tape. That's why I came up with that other way of saying it. All right, now here's the thing. The saw blade only rests on one side. So when you want to cut the other angle going that way, you actually have to move the trim around. We'll extend that arm. The reason I made the mark about an inch and a half off the edge here, because on the thick piece of wood, that's where the blade makes contact first. All right. So I can actually hold this board in place, line that up. And like I mentioned before, we'll do a quick cut line to confirm, and then we can make an adjustment if we need to. Yeah, I'm just not quite long enough. There we go. Now, that little bit of a nick there is not going to be an issue. We can take care of that during our touch-up phase. But that is how we set up that outside, double outside corner. Now, that's my first measurement for my other cut. Okay, perfect. Take our notes, scratch off, those cuts are done. Next piece. So now I'm going to do the 20 and 5 eighths. Okay, now my material's upside down. So how you visualize this, this side will be square and this side will have that inside corner. First thing we have to do is square this off. Don't ever think or assume that because it comes from the supplier or the store, even if it looks nice, that it's square. A lot of times they're running this board fast through the machines and it gets cut even on a one degree angle. It'll wreck your day. So always hold things nice to the fence and clean up your own edge. All right. Now we can measure from that. 20 and... Oh, hang on. That's an inside corner. Whoops, I got my own self spun around here. When you're measuring an inside corner, you measure the whole width of the board, 20 and 5 eighths, right? What we're going to do is we're going to cut that off first. Oops, we'll put that measurement where the saw blade will make contact. There we go. All right. Okay. So now the board is the right length, but we want to cut this off. So we've got two choices. I can guess 
I can tilt my saw. I can come over here and I can throw a cut line on it and throw a cut line on it, throw a cut line on it and go crazy. Or we can cheat and come at it from over here. Because I can set the blade off the back of that wood right there. That's my spot. And I can see that. And you'll notice I'm not going to get all the way through because it makes contact. Yeah, makes contact on both sides. Here's a little trick. Since we're holding the material up against the fence, it holds it square. I can cut and trim off the back side. Perfect every time. So now we got 35 and a half. That's our last piece. So let's get this up. Let's visualize 35 and a half. So we're going to be coming out of the corner on, on the 45 that way. 35 and a half over here. We're also going to be cutting that way. <laughs> Seems awful tricky, right? Well, what you can do, here's another trick. You can add the thickness of the material, which is three quarters. You can add that to this measurement, all right? which ends up making it 36 and a quarter. And here's why. If we cut this at 36 and a quarter, this is actually where the outside of that cut finishes off. And this gives us flexibility. Okay. That's also a cut. All right. You see where I'm going with this? Now I can lay my saw flat, turn this around, and I can cut that from here. And I can line that up right to where my blade is touching the edge. And finish my cut. And then I'm going to switch sides again. You remember I'm cutting this angle, so I'm going to be cutting from here. So what I can do is I can measure over three quarters of an inch. Remember, when you're cutting on a 45 degree angle, the dimension on this side of the line and this side of the line are exactly the same. So that's just a little bit old grade five math that you can employ. So you can make a, a mark here at three quarters of an inch and your saw blade will make that contact first. So what we do is set this back, okay? We're going to hold that in place. Now what I got to do is I got to cheat because I got to be able to look underneath. All right. Get this out of my way. I am loving that. And that is how you can make all these cuts in a variety of different ways. The secret is Measure it once and cut it twice or three times or four times or whatever it takes. But you can work back towards your lines. So now I've got my inside corner. So the outside corner is four and seven eighths long, all right? Which basically means 15 sixteenths. But what we're going to do is we're going to call it five short. It's easier, much easier math. And the way you want to do this on this saw is you add the thickness of the wood times two. So three quarters gives you one and a half. So we're actually going to cut six and a half short. But we're going to try to do six and a half first because it's easy to shim off a little bit. But that gives us a little flexibility. So here we go, right? Um, because we're doing outside corners, let's start with the easy one. We'll go over here and we'll just cut an edge. Okay, now we can measure back. Six and a half, was it? If you're ever not sure, there we go. That's why we always write things down. It makes life so much easier. This, this cut would come from this side, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to have to run a few times here because the measurement is based on the thick part of the dimension. So I'm going to have to start a couple of saw cuts here and cut right through until I see where it comes in contact with that pencil and then we'll commit. Okay, now it only takes a couple seconds to do that, but then you get a perfect measurement. Here we go. 
All right, so before you assemble all these pieces, just do a quick check. Make sure that it's all going to fit, right? That's a little bit tight down here on the bottom. So I'm going to take, just going to mark this, cut that one a little shy. Okay, that's a little bit too far off the edge. So the easiest cut for me to make is on this side. So I'm going to scribe here. And you know what? This is the time to do it. If you run a bunch of measurements, go to the saw and cut them, and then come and double check, and if things need a little bit of modification, that's fine. Because we're intentionally marking just a little bit long so that we, if we have problems with the saw or the cutting, we can make those adjustments without throwing wood in the garbage. This one is also just a, it's a little bit long, but not really. I'm going to leave that one alone. One more trick just to, before we assemble is if you're working on a whole room, always start with your long walls. If you do all your long walls first and you make a mistake on the trim, you can use that piece of wood to cut smaller pieces in the room. If you start with the small intricate ones like I am and you make mistakes, all you're doing is throwing out wood that has no other value. So remember, start big, work to small, and then when you get to these corners, cut everything first, double check the fit, and then when you get the perfect fitting, then we're going to assemble and install. Boom, boom, and boom. This is where it gets interesting because in this old house, this part of the floor actually caves down a little bit. So you don't want to follow the contour. Now this is old home trimming techniques. If you're in a new place and everything's flat and level, great, good for you. You can just nail it in as you go. But what I want to do is actually connect all these pieces with glue and nails first. And then when I put it in, I'm going to put it tight on the corners and the bottom in the back here is going to raise up. And it's going to follow a level line so I can have nice joints. And that is going to be the key to my success here. We're just going to slide that glue around a little bit, make a joint. We're going to nail through the side into that other three quarter inch thick wood. Mm -hmm. One up here. Beautiful. Okay. Softwood lumber is really predictable. We're also going to do this corner. Same thing. Okay. Slide the glue around a little bit. It's basically the same thing. Holding everything nice and tight, fingers out of the way. And visually, this bar, you know what straight. The nail's going in straight. Line it up so you know it's not going to stick out. Just in case. <laughs> now, we've got all three pieces together. Now watch what happens. I put it in the corner. Okay. So you'll see the trim over here. There's a big gap at the bottom, even when it's tight at the top. And that's because that whole piece of trim over on my elbow, my elbow side is down and it's causing that to open up. See how that works? So this is how I know that the floor is caving away. So if I lift the other side and close that gap and then nail it, then it's going to be nice and tight because the biggest enemy you have to install in your trim is uh, contact later on. If the trim isn't nice and snug to the wall, you're going to vacuum or sweep or the kids are playing around with the ball, things are going to get broken and chipped and knocked out of position. So make sure here we go. When you nail it, everything stays nice and tight. Try your best to install your nails into the framing behind it. And if you can, put it in the contour, the detail of the work. Now this particular wall is actually full with heat run, so there's nothing there to attach this to other than the drywall. So I know that if I want to take a risk of puncturing that the grill, right, making all that noise, we're going to leave that alone. Over here, I'm going to bring that wood right down to where the casing is. <laughs> here we go. That's installed. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of people saying, oh, why didn't you leave the gap all the way around for the flooring? It's because the gap is going to be inconsistent. So even if I raise it high enough for the flooring to go underneath, I'm going to have the same problem of a huge gap in some places and not in others. 
And so the way we handle that is with a small little piece of trim. Now there are a ton of different shoe molds on the market. This one is designed to be added after the flooring goes in. It is a half an inch deep, so there's plenty of room for expansion contraction gaps no matter what kind of flooring you're using. So I'm going to do the flooring first. You can have this pre-painted, and I'm just going to add some uh, no-nails adhesive on the back. I'll stick it in place, and tell me how sexy that looks. It's not quarter round, it's not ugly. So if you go to these specialty stores, you can get quarter round or shoe mold trims like this that match the design profile, and it looks amazing when it's all finished. That gives you all the flexibility you need in older homes to be able to finish after the flooring, and it's a quick little step to run around the room. So once all your trim is installed, then we pull out the caulking gun because we want to finish our job nice, and we just want to get a little bit of a cut on an angle. You can see there is not a lot of room for that caulking to come out. That is perfect. I like it like that because I don't want to use too much, then I don't have to wipe it all away. And you'll see that bead that I'm throwing there. It's a perfect gap between the trim and the wall. Okay. Whenever you think you've you got too much excess, you can just rub it in further down the line here. Sometimes these gaps are a little tricky to work with. It's kind of like drywall work, right? Always. There we go. Finish the other direction from a corner so you don't have any of those ridges. All right. We're going to go around, we're going to cock all of the gaps. Sweet. Remember, resist the temptation to use this caulking to fill the little holes. Because this will shrink a little bit when it dries, and then when the light hits it the right way, everybody's going to see the little dents. It's going to look like junk. So now our inside and outside miters are glued and nailed. We still finish off with the tiniest bead of the caulking. Okay. Making sure not to leave any extra on the wood so that when you go to paint, you aren't going to have nasty little ridges. Now, this is why I mentioned when you do everything with a 45 degree angle, it's not always perfect. But you can finish perfect, okay? Just run this finger up like this in the direction you're heading. Don't forget to cock around the doors to the wall. And in your miter joints on the face. These things are all nailed and, and glued together, but don't want to rely on the paint to fill all those gaps and cracks in. Okay. As well, always do that gap of the door casing to the door jam. That'll soften up that edge, get rid of that shadow, and then it'll paint in perfectly. If you don't use enough the first time, and you see a crack, go back and fix it. Don't ever leave a job that you're not happy with. There we go. Nice. Once you've done all your caulking, it's time to fill your nail holes so that the caulking has time to set. Now this is a two hour dryer like I mentioned, so put this away <laughs> and let's get on to the other putty. Okay, so this is when you're going to want your four inch knife. And we don't have to make a lot of putty, so I'll just make a little bit of a circle here. Hopefully, we've got enough material here that'll hold a little bit of water. Now, this is a 45 minute compound, so it does take a few minutes to set up. And when mixed with cold water, it gives you a little bit longer working time. So what happens is the water starts to work its way through the mud and it slowly will penetrate. But you can speed the process up just by sprinkling it from the outside edges. Okay. Now 
this takes a little bit of practice. So if you're new to this and you try to do this, I would suggest doing it in a place where if your volcano collapsed and it ran off all four corners at the same time, it's not going to be in a place where you're going to make a mess you're going to regret. <laughs> now, I'm a little shy on powder here, it feels like. All right, there we go. Mm-hmm. That's just too loose. We are trying to make this more of a putty. It's kind of like, almost like baking glass here, you know? Just keep on putting a little bit more of that on there. There we go. Okay. Now, we don't want it lumpy. We want it nice and smooth. So you want to work it up a little bit using the side of the knife. Okay. Now we're good. Now there's two holes you have to fill. Remember that we have the holes on the flat section and we have the holes on the detail. Okay, so I'm gonna just wipe a little bit on my finger and I'm gonna just press that into the hole. Okay, a little goes a long way. So the more you put on your finger, the more you're gonna be wiping off when, after you're done filling the hole. And for those other details on those flat sections, don't trust your finger because your finger's around that it'll pull some of the material up. Just use your four inch knife. Done. That's easy. Now this stuff doesn't shrink when it dries. So after it's dry, you can take your sanding sponge, give it a quick run. You're ready for paint. So one of the last elements, of course, is the trim work. We're gonna just discuss that real quick. Now here I've got quarter round going underneath the door to close the gap. And then I'm gonna just bring a little bit of a detail to it. Beautiful. I'm just firing. Probably three nails will be lots. That's done. Okay. Nice. So you'll notice that this kind of trim, although the floor is wonky because it's so thin, you can manipulate it to follow any contour. That is beautiful. So today I'm going to show you my system for trimming out a window. And now we're not just adding in the jams and the trim, we're actually going to be using this bull nosing here and make a nice sill so that you can use this as a decorative shelf, maybe some herb plants and that sort of thing. It's in the kitchen. It's nice to dress it up a little bit. And whenever I'm doing a tile job with a window trim, I like to get the tile done first so that it has room for its expansion and contraction behind all my trims, very key. And then I can build over top of it all and get a nice clean finished look without having cut tile all up and down the side of my window trims. I'm telling you right now, if you do it this way, your windows are going to look spectacular. They're going to have a huge pop. Let's just jump into this and we'll get the process started. So first of all, I'm in an old house, right? This is my 1880 farmhouse kitchen that we're renovating. And if you haven't been following along, then I suggest just click the link up here and you can start from the very beginning. But for everybody else who just wants to learn how to trim out a window, what we're looking at is using this regular one by five softwood lumber stock, okay? It's tongue and groove. And what we're doing is we're going to create a box. This is called the jam extension. We're gonna do the whole jam extension first, and then we're going to insulate it and then trim it. And here's why. In an old house like this, uh, in foaming in the window, you want to be a little bit conservative with your foam so that you're not over foaming and causing it all the stick. But in the jam area here is where we have the ability after the fact to really get another layer of expansion foam in there as a protection against drafts. So we're going to take full advantage of that. But first we have to cut and measure all of our jam extensions to the exact depth from the window out to the face of the tile. So let's get started. So I'm going to use the back of this. I've already cut my first sill. It's wider than I need to. It, it, it makes my life simple. Now I've got a writing surface, okay? So I'm going to put uh, uh, bottom left, top left, uh, top right, and then bottom right. These are going to be my numbers so that I can measure, trace my lines, and cut all on the saw at the same time. So what I'm going to do is just take out my tape measure. So I'm going to just lay my wood across the tile to create my, my depth. And I'm going to measure this off 
and it says four inches. Okay, so that's the bottom right. And then we're just going to do this all the way around the window, get all my numbers. Four and a quarter. All right. So now I've got my measurements. I'm going to first cut all of my lengths and then I'm going to go take it out to the, the saw. So I already have my bottom, if you can imagine this. Okay. And because of the kind of sill trim that I'm going to use, I'm going to be bringing this up to about this spot on the window, about of an eighth of an inch below this trim. And I'm going to maintain that all the way around the window. When I purchased these windows, I had the option to have a, a track installed. It's a part of the PVC mold and it would receive the wood, but I find that to be very, very frustrating. And you have to install one piece at a time. There's a lot of other fussing around. I prefer to just go right up against the vinyl window and leave myself a little bit of an expansion gap and cover that gap with a finished white pure silicone. That way I don't have to worry about painting it, I don't get graying over time, and I don't have problems with expansion and contraction. So, I'm going to leave one eighth of an inch all the way around the outside of this window. Okay? So that's how I'm going to measure. So, I'm going to measure from the inside down to that trim, 36 and an eighth, and I'm going to add an eighth of an inch for the top. And that takes me, that's actually a quarter, 36 and a quarter, 36 and three eighths. I'm going to put a little bit more on there. I'm going to go 36 and a half. So I need two at 36 and a half. And then I'm going to need one more across the top. I think for simplicity, we'll just go long. Yeah, we'll go 33 and a half, just like we did here. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to go to the saw. I'm going to cut my other jams. I'm going to trace out my lines and run that through the table saw. And then we'll whip it all back together. So here's my top sill. And we are going to be running everything on the table saw so that the lead edge, okay, is not getting cut. We're going to cut the back side. And that's because we're going to add the silicone and it's going to be a surface, kind of a cove bead. So it'll cover any of the inconsistencies on the table saw because I'm not cutting straight, I'm cutting on an angle. And it'll also give me a nice straight edge when I'm putting on my casing so that all looks perfect. So you got to imagine this upside down and installed, all right? The left side I have my measurement, four and a quarter. And I'm going to measure from my front edge and you can just put an arrow on it if it helps. Four and a quarter. And on this side it is four inches. All right, that's one. That's the top, obviously. And this will be the left side. There's my lead edge. Okay, All right, so here's the front. This is the bottom. It's four and a quarter all the way across. So I don't have to mark that and trace it. I'll just set the, the guide on my saw for four and a quarter for that one. It makes it simple. The other side is four. We'll set the guide for that one. And this one is the bottom. We'll call that my lead edge. Okay. The right side is four and a quarter. Sorry, the left side is four and a quarter. The right side is four. Here we go. Okay, so I've got all the information I need on these boards now. I'm going to go with the saw once and make all my cuts. And remember, when you're working with this, don't be afraid if you take a little bit too much off. If you're an extra sixteenth or something, it's not going to be an issue. It's, or if you're even a little bit too long, you're going to be okay. Once you put this on, no surface is perfectly flat, especially in an old farmhouse. There's going to be areas there where you're going to be using the silicone afterwards behind the wood, especially with detailed tile. So we're not being concerned about being perfect here. We're just making sure that we're going to be close enough so that when we do all of our silicone work, then it looks perfect. All right. That's the secret. Don't be difficult and hard on yourself right now because everything here is expanding and contracting. So you want to make sure you have a little bit of room everywhere for that to happen. If you make things too precise, 
you're going to find out that everything, when it moves, it's going to cause you issues. So, let's get to the saw. So the piece that goes here, I actually ran through the saw really quickly and took off just a hair because it has a rounded edge naturally from the factory. And because I'm laminating the sill on there, I didn't want to have that. I need it nice and flat. So this is going to go here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this up just to mark where my wood is going to make contact. So an eighth of an inch past there, eighth of an inch past there. Okay, I'm going to translate that information to the other piece, which I cut the same length. This way, I'll help to ensure that my window stays square. All right. Now, I'm going to nail all of this together in advance of using any of this. Right? Nice and simple. I'm not dealing with a ton of extra space here, so I think we'll set it up like this. Oh yeah, lovely. One thing to remember, always use glue on your finished carpentry. You have to glue your joints, or you're not doing finished carpentry. You're just sticking wood together, and it's all going to come apart again. All right. Now, I'm using an 18 gauge, 18 gauge finish nailer. It's just going to pop in uh, two or three. I got two inches in here right now, which is probably a little overkill. However, a little bit of know how and self control. We're going to be all right. Okay. So remember, I want to line this up on my pencil mark and flush on the front and not be too concerned. And don't leave your finger in the way. Just in the odd case that the nail comes back out. That is pain you don't ever want to experience. <laughs> so the goal here, when you're working on site instead of in a shop, you gotta be a little more creative. Generally speaking, we wanna get that on that nail mark, the pencil mark, sorry. And then we'll get glue on this end. And then there we go. This area here is all up against the window. And if it doesn't make contact, it's not as big an issue as whether or not the front is flush. See if we know what we're doing. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna work. All right. Whew. Now let's just double check this. And you can see it is a little bit thicker than what I need, but my wall is so inconsistent. I'd rather be a little bit thicker. I'm loving that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use shims to put all this in place. But my, the, the best kind of shim in this situation, because I have a lot of room that I have to cover, is a couple of spare blocks of this. I'll be right back. So for anyone who's inquisitive and wants to know why there's two different kinds of foams on this window, <laughs> because I was out of spray foam when we went to go and install this window the first time. And we did that in a video. We'll put that link in the description up in the card here. Um, I used a foam from my local hardware store and it expanded so much that I couldn't open the window. Unbelievable. I don't usually use that brand and that's probably why. <laughs> so I had to go back out to the store, get my other brand, and then cut out all that foam and reinstall the window. Unbelievable. Anyway, 
lesson learned, eh? Once you've got something you know that you like, stick with it. So, I'm going to put these blocks down. Done. Now, I can shim the difference. That'll be a lot more convenient. Okay. Now, the nature of shims is that they're wedges. And if you reverse them, put them together, they're the same thickness, which helps a lot. So I'm going to go start with two on each side, just to get this closer to where we want to be. Okay. Like I said, in an 1880s farmhouse, nothing is level except for what you put in. <laughs> So you're forever making minor adjustments, eh? I'm liking this side. Not liking this side yet. Hang up a little bit here. Okay, once you're happy with the height, you wanna just check here and here, make sure that the gap is the same on both of those. Okay, don't worry about the top anymore once you get the height where you want it. We're just gonna drive through the shim. Now generally, if we, because we use a laser level when we install our windows, that should be <laughs> perfect. It is. Once you have this installed level, this one eighth gap should be consistent all the way to the top. And then you can just double check with your square. I mean, that's just money in the bank, isn't it? Taking the time to make things off of a laser when you're building makes everything simpler. So now I don't even have to think about it. I can just push a little bit of resistance going the opposite direction with my 5-in-1 here. Set my depth. 2-inch now. Good. Done. Now that's why I said that we're going to use expansion foam later. Because of the nature of how this house is built, I don't have really good framing. So by throwing that expansion foam in, that's going to bond everything together really nicely. I'm just going to finish with a couple of nails here. Getting pressure to the window. Uh -huh. Okay, nice. There we go. Step one is complete. Now, like I said, we want to also guard against drafts. Remember that there's two panes. This is a, a double hung. So I have a thermal layer here and a thermal layer here. There are different layers. If you fill the entire cavity with expansion foam so that you can take care of both of these thermal layers at the very beginning, you're going to run into trouble. So generally, we don't get that expansive with it. See, my nails are just making contact. I'm not going to overshoot this with foam, but I am going to put in a little bit here so that I have a good bond. Okay, here we go. Just across the front. Alright, I'm not going to overfill. That's basically the structure for my window now. Make sure I got a good thermal break. There we go. Nice. Of course, across the top. Ah! Here we are. Now, if you're shooting at the side instead of at the back, then you'll get the foam to fill in front and has room to grow into the back. If I just point straight in, I'm going to fill it so full that it'll all end up bowing out. Close the gun. Love the foam gun. Uh, just a quick note. When you're done, close the handle. Always set it upside down so that the gas isn't constantly leaking out. All right. It'll also keep it from falling over. Beautiful. That's it. <laughs> Woo. Now we have a window jam. Now it's time for the fun part. Okay. 
now it's time for the sill. Now, this is going to get contact right there. All right, that is going to be a lot of fun. The way that we take care of this and measuring this out is you want to kind of find that middle of the window-ish, okay? And you could always take a pencil and, and mark a center line. And there you go. Now when you're working, you have something to reference from if it, if it falls apart on you. But what I'm looking to do is set my window casing about there. I have the full rounded corner and I have a casing starting. And I want to make sure that when I put that casing there, I've got room to add my painter's caulking and then I can paint that all together. So now my trim is going to go from about this point moving out I want my sill to extend just a little bit past the full width of the trim. Now, let me show you this. I cut this earlier. That'll be the trim. Now, on that pencil mark there, which is about a full eighth, maybe three sixteenths. Okay, now I have the width of my trim. I can make that mark. You can see that you don't want this extending way past there, but perhaps an inch up to where that tile is would look really good. Then, I have a thinner version of the same trim series that's going to go underneath, all right? And you want that to go, <laughs> you want that to finish up at the same point here as underneath. So we're gonna extend this a little bit. So there's my mark, here we go. Put this down before I get whacked in the head. So from my center mark, my trim was 19 and 3 eighths. Okay, so I'm going to add an inch to that, 20 and 3 eighths, and I'll go this way, and I'll rather cut this thing on both ends, and know that I've got it the same dimension. Okay, that's where we're going to cut it, that's our length, right? But, the outside corner of this is actually right here, right? But what we want to do is we want to cut that on a 45 degree angle. Isn't that interesting? So by using this square, you can line it up, to create a cut line for your saw, right there. Okay, that's going to be my cut line. And then I'm also going to cut another piece, so that this detail is cut opposite, like from this angle. Here, I'll cut this first. We've got to square off the end. Don't ever work with trim from the factory. Always cut your end first before you measure, okay? They never come straight. And I'm going to cut that, and I'm going to cut this. What this is going to give me is this piece to fit around so that this detail will go back to the wall. I'm going to do that on both sides. Just thought I would draw that out for you. When I come back from the saw, I'll pit, fit this all together, glue it and nail it first, and then we can install it. Now you might notice, I don't know if it shows up on camera very well, but I've already pre-painted all this trim in the first coat. I just like it because it seems to save me a whole lot of effort and energy from bending over the counters and painting everything. I don't mind doing one coat when I'm done, but I don't want to have to do the primer and everything else. It's nice to get all that done first. Now, I'm just taking a sanding block, getting rid of any of these loose hairs, okay? Get the right end, match it up. Put on a little bit of glue, because we're gluing everything as we go here. Okay, this is why I have my counter covered in a garbage bag exactly where I want it. I'm going to fire in. Okay, here we are. Now, the nail is really just designed to hold that in place until the glue dries. All right, so we're going to do both, both ends here. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, you can see this starting to come together, right? Now you can see this coming together. Okay, so next. Because it's a sill, you can, might be putting things on here that are like one or two pounds, maybe five pounds. You want to actually attach this so it doesn't actually break off. The secret to that is this. Construction screws, okay? Not only do we want to make sure that it doesn't fall off, but we want to make sure that that is bonded with the glue so tightly, it's under compression, that it becomes one piece of wood. And because we cut it with the saw, that's going to be difficult. So we want to add the extra strength of the screw here, 
all right, so that we don't run into problems down the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put some pre-drill holes in here because I want that screw to go exactly where I want it and into this trim. So I'm going to pre-drill my hole. Getting the screws in before I start is like having an extra pair of hands. All right, here we go. Whew. Okay. I don't really need to take the glue that far, do I? Going over the tile. <laughs> what am I thinking? All right. Here we go. Now, this is where having that center line comes in handy. You want to hold that center line together. Now you want to put your pressure right here. And make sure your sill is nice and flush. Because it's pre-drilled, it's going to go into that meat. Before you sink that screw all the way in, make sure all the other screws are started. Because you could tilt everything out of position. We actually want to drive the screw in till it's past the surface and that gives us perfect compression. You want to do this until you have a hole that can be filled. And anybody who's a fan of my channel knows what's coming next. We're going to get some 45 foot, mix it up and fill that in. That way we can sand the back off and have a perfect paintable surface. getting there. Now just a note, if you go to a proper trim supplier, they do make this nosing as a one piece, if your window is the right dimension. Um, because our house is old, the dimensional lumber is thicker than usual, and I added an extra layer on top of the finished wood siding. I did not expect my window to bring it all the way in far enough that I could do this one piece. Turns out that I needed a half an inch more than the regular stock, so that's why I had to do a two piece. Doing it this way is nice and simple. If you were doing the one piece, you could literally just measure the whole length that you wanted, okay? And then you would just cut the L's out of the piece. And you still have to buy a piece of bullnose to do the rounded edge, right? So it's kind of like, I like doing two piece just because I have all that flexibility. I don't have to worry about making mistakes. Here we go. That is awesome. Now, we just have to put on our casing. <laughs> Let's do that. This is as simple as measuring roughly, right? Uh, uh, right there. So I just translate my mark on here and I put my pencil mark on a 45 and I'll get another couple pieces and we'll do that. Yeah, about there. Now, just for fun, because I've leveled everything, I should be able to take both of these marks and they should be in the same spot. Okay, there we go. So I am going to just put a little bit of a mark on there so I know I'm going to go cut these and install them. Now, I enjoy the DeWalt gun, but there is one feature that drives me nuts. This gun doesn't stop shooting nails when it runs out. <laughs> if you're like me, um, I, I used to have a rigid gun. And I tell you, I don't know why I bought this. It must have been on sale or something. But the rigid gun, it always stops when you run out of nails. I don't know how many times I've been just going along nailing any baseboards. Can't tell when you're out of nails. You turn around and everything's falling off the wall. You're like, anyway, I don't know why I needed to share that. I needed the vent. DeWalt, fix your gun. <laughs> Here we go. Gonna get that on my mark that I like, and I'm driving these nails right into the jam. That's all I've got to work with. 
Okay, then I'm going to measure and cut my top piece and I need to have the flexibility to make sure everything closes up perfect. Here we are. Okay, so because we cut the jam square, the same dimensions, I don't have to crawl up to the top to measure this. All I do is take this measurement across the bottom and I can cut the top piece and put my miters on. It's no problem. Now this is uh, just a sixteenth shy of 39. Nice. All right, now remember, wherever you have raw wood to raw wood, got a glue. I'm gonna tell you every time I do it because if you don't, your joints are guaranteed to crack. If you have cracking joints on your window trim and your baseboards, it's because they aren't gluing it properly. There's just no two ways around it. Some things in life you can make pretty for a weekend, but if you want it to be pretty forever, you just gotta do it right. Okay, I'm not even gonna think about this. I have three quarter inch wood. I'm gonna throw a nail in it now. Love nail guns, by the way. You know, in the old days, you'd uh, pull off the trim that had this two-inch spike that they had to put in with a hammer. God, to be a finished carpenter back in the day, eh? unreal what they had to go through. All right. Now we just want to make sure our gap is right. <clears throat> Nail in our jam. Of course, we still have the piece underneath to do. We still have to do the caulking and the putty and the filler. Oh, I think we should probably get to all that in just a second here. This is the door casing. It's massive, right? This is a smaller version of the same trim. So it has the same trim profile, just without the flat piece, which makes it larger. This makes a great decorative detail underneath. It was also the perfect size for me because I've got these huge windows in a kitchen and I need to do counter plugs. So in order to make room, obviously I put the plugs on the side and I use a laser level to mount those so that everything is perfect. Now, this leaves me just enough room to get my cover plates on. <laughs> Amazing. I'll take what I have and I'll show you two options for finishing underneath. One is the same thing. You cut the 45 return piece just like we did with the other. And you know what? That's such a small piece of wood. I'm just going to let that sit there. This is another situation where I'll use painter's tape. But I never use tape when I paint. <laughs> That's just how it works, baby. There we go. There we go. That's all I need. I'm going to set that aside to dry. So here's one option. I set the saw on 25 degrees and it's just a, a straight cut. Okay? There's no return trim. You can paint that in and you get that look. That's not terrible. Right? Now the way that you would install this, especially over tile, is you've got to really be thinking now because you want to shoot on an angle just underneath that detailed trim up into the up into the sill. Okay? And you can do that. And then you're not actually attaching this to the, the tile. You don't have to use um, no nails or any kind of adhesives. You just throw a few nails up there and you're good to go. When we're all done, we're going to put a thin line of silicone on here just to seal it up. And that would be the solution to that problem. There we go. Okay. Or, so we have that option, or we have this option. And you get to decide which one you like. Personally, I'm a big fan of cutting trims back to the return. They look sort of similar, but I just like that detail from the side. And when you're using thick trim, how it looks from the side is important. Okay. So today is crown molding day and I am excited because my delivery came. I have a special plaster faced, how do you call it, styrofoam crown molding. It's pretty cool stuff and it's really awesome for the DIYer because you can get amazing performance with really easy installation all by yourself. But I figured, hey, if I'm going to do that, let's do a video. We'll show the differences between doing the wood crown and that crown and that way no matter which material you choose, you'll have the tools and the secrets so that you can be successful. So I went by my trim shop because I had to get some stuff for the windows and I grabbed a couple pieces of wood crown molding. Now just a word of warning if you're using wood, remember depending on the moisture content of the wood at the time that it gets milled, you might have differences in sizes as far as a finished product is concerned when you go to install it. 
That's the only downside to using wood. It is a little inconsistent as far as making really good miter joints. But that's what caulking is for. So let's get into it. So before we get started, I need to cut myself a cheat piece. And this is important because wood has movement and warp. So what you want to do is have about a two foot long section with an inside and an outside miter on it. So that when you're installing your wood, you can use that to help roll your corners just perfectly. I'll show you all this information in a second. But first, let's get this just done here. <laughs> Most types of crown have a very similar property in the fact that they are designed to be a perfect representation of the angle no matter which way you install it. Which means that the distance from the back of the fence to the, to the front of the crown here and the back of the fence to the top of the crown here is exactly the same when it's installed flush against both surfaces. All right. Now you can double check with a tape measure, but what I do is I like to set my crown up, grab myself a black marker because this just makes the whole day so much faster. And I'll mark my fence. Watch this. There's my line. Okay. Now when I'm working, I know exactly where to set this. I just walk up, roll it until it's in position, and I can cut. The other thing you can do, now that it's in there nice and tight, you can set up your 45 line, going in both directions. All right. Now your saw is all set up so that you don't have to pull out the tape measure or roll things around. The last thing you need to know, and this is difficult, is the detail. Generally speaking, the beefier detail goes at the bottom and this, the slender profile goes at the top. So all this extra detail here, you want to keep that very consistent and make sure you pay attention to that because if you're installing and you've cut it upside down, nothing's going to line up and it'll drive you crazy. So, Okay, I'm making this really obvious. That's the bottom, that's the top. When you put it in your saw, here we go, you actually want to not cut it this way. You actually want to cut it upside down. Okay? Now here's the secret. If that confuses you at all, <laughs> stand behind your saw when you're looking at your cuts. And you'll be like, it just makes sense now. Because now you're looking at it the same way you will be when you lift it up and put it on the ceiling. Okay? And it can get a little confusing. But you have to cut your crown upside down so that all you have to do is move 45 degrees inside and outside corner with a saw set up perfect 90. Now, as long as you do that, you'll be very, very successful. The last thing you want to do is this. Remember, the devil is in the details. And whenever you're working with finished carpentry like a crown molding and you're doing miters, the most important element is this, the saw is set to lock at 45 degrees in one direction, but you have to be 90 degrees here. So grab your square, roll your guard out, okay? Actually, I'll do it from this side. And then slide your square against your blade. If you have contact here but not here, then make adjustment in the back. You can't cut anything like that because none of your joints are gonna line up. So just roll it back until it's perfect and then lock it in place. Now we're ready to go. You can use this system here to set your degree cut, but the reality is, is that your, 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 little, your little detail here that's showing you what angle you're at is in a set screw. And it may or may not be perfect. So it's better to always check with your saw with the square, which isn't gonna lie to you, than something like this that can move around over time. So let's get to our demonstration. Now we're dealing with softwood lumber here, so we don't need to worry about putting blocking in behind the walls and that sort of thing. We can install this just with caulking and brad nails, guaranteed to be fine. But what you want to do is you want to hold your profile, put it up in the space, all right? And I'm going in the inside corner, so you want your miter to be facing towards you. This one isn't very pretty, so I'm going to cut it again. Remember, I'm going to put it upside down, drop it on the fence really quickly with my lines. That's my location. I'm going to turn and cut. And just for fun, this is only a 10 inch saw. You don't need to have a big powerful machine. You don't need compound miter sliding, all those bells and whistles. $200 gets you a quality saw. Just be sure to put a quality blade on it. Find yourself an 80 tooth for finished carpentry. So I'm using a door and window latex caulking with silicone, which is an elastomeric property so it doesn't crack over time. 
Oh, one second. I didn't open this thing up yet. This one's brand new. There we go. Cut the tip on an angle. Slide it in. And with latex caulking, there's nothing to puncture. So you just go right ahead. All we do is run a little bead right here on the bottom. Okay, and then right on the top. Now I've got my profile sheet and I stick it in the corner. And you can see they both feel pretty flush to the wall and the ceiling, but they're not in the same spot. So what I gotta do is find that happy place where they line up. And if I have a gap at the top, I have a gap up here, it means I need to roll this piece up onto the ceiling. And so now I've got the, the bottom at the same spot, I'll roll both of them together until the gap is closed. There we go. Now I've got it in position. Just take out the nail gun, shoot up the detail. Huh, that's not going anywhere. Now the way you finish that, of course, is just use a caulking tube and you want to put a nice bead of caulking up here, okay? There we go. Now a lot of people will fill their nail holes with the the caulking as well. That's fine if your cock, if your trim is nine or ten feet in the air. If you're only at eight feet, the caulking is going to shrink, and you're going to see every single pinhole if you're walking through the house, if you have a discerning eye. So I would suggest using more like a drywall compound or a um, glazing putty that you can fill all those holes that won't shrink. Now, now that I've shown you how the wood properties work, let's go do the other way. So here is my new product. This is styrofoam. Now it's a pretty medium density styrofoam, so it's actually a lot stronger than just the old white stuff you used to have in your basements, but it is plaster faced, okay? It's a spray on application, pretty sure. It's amazing because it can actually do curved walls because it can twist when it's in its curved position. So awesome. The benefit for us is that it installs using drywall compound. That's it, nice and simple. So your butt joints are just square cut, your miter joints, you just put mud in the corner and squeeze it all together and wipe it out with a sponge. Let's get to this installation. I'll show you how different it is and all the different techniques for cutting this one on the saw. One of the first benefits that you see right away is that these trims come in a variety of sizes. And because it's a styrofoam, look at the length of that. That's almost two inches of profile contacting with the wall. That makes it incredibly easy to attach to the surface. Also makes it easy to set on your your saw, you just literally set it in place and you know you're good, okay? There's no real variance here. If it's not tight, you'll tell. You just give it a little push, good to go. <laughs> Same thing applies though. Leave the, the majority of your detail for the bottom. And of course, we're cutting upside down. First cut we have here is an inside miter. I need a little bit more room. There we go. Set this out to 45. Make sure your blade, of course, is 90 to the table and off we go. So one of the benefits of using this material, you don't need the nail gun or the compressor, which means if you're a homeowner and you own a saw, you've got all the tools you need to put in crown molding. This is just awesome. That's just freaking awesome. I wonder if this is gonna be big enough. Look at that. Okay, well, it seems that my 10 inch saw is just a hair shy no worries, <laughs> I have a knife. I can finish the cut with it. Awesome. Now this is a pretty large profile. You can get them a little smaller or a little larger if you dare. If you have a 12 inch saw, you'd be in great shape. Now, that's my outside corner. I first need to do, I need to measure. Now there's three ways to measure inside corner to inside corner for crown molding. I would recommend taking a look you can measure across the bottom and you can run past your corner and read the tape. In that situation, that would be 73 and 7 8 You can put it inside and bend your tape in and take a, your best guess. <laughs> or you can leave it like this and run it across and you can take the actual measurement where it contacts the tape and then check your tape and it'll have the actual dimension of the tape itself and you can add those two numbers together. Depending on the situation, I use all three different techniques. <laughs> but again, so this situation here, because I have inside corners, 
it's a lot easier for me to just run the tape right past. I'm going to go with 73 and 7 8 Good to go. So remember, you want to measure from the outside of this point. Okay. 73 and 7 8 is our number. This is the bottom. And once you get used to this, it will move actually quite quick. 73 and 7 8 It's right there. And I also want to put a mark. It's an inside corner coming back this way. One of the reasons I love having my saw on a stand is because when you have space confines, you can just slide it down and give yourself a little more room. All right, here we go. Again, set to 45. We can just bring this down. Now, because you're dealing with the material, that's getting applied with drywall compound, all of these inside corners, even if they're not perfect, are going to be filled up and smoothed in with a wet sponge with the drywall compound. Even if you have to cut it and it's a little off, it's going to be just fine. All right, here we go. So now we have our piece of crown. Last thing you want to do is just go up and double check. If you've cut it a little bit too long and it's sitting bowed, then it's not going to adhere to the wall very well. That's going to be awesome. You really want to roll it around back and forth until it's snug in the wall, just like it was on the saw fence. Okay, and then just to help visually, you can make your marks. Here we go. Now we can put the mud on and stick in place. So now we're using all purpose compound for drywall. Now the secret is this, when you buy your drywall compound, it actually needs to have water mixed in with it to make it nice and smooth. So if you're interested in that process, you're not familiar with that, you can click this video link right here and you can watch how we prepare the mud. But if you've already been through this process and you're in a renovation and you've been doing the drywall, this will be really easy. If you're not used to using a drywall knife, this could be challenging, then I would suggest just start with a little bit at a time, okay? And you want to just kind of use it like a snow plow and then flatten it out, okay? You don't need to have too much mud here because it's just going to all end up coming out all over the ceiling and making a huge mess. There we go. We're looking for positive contact and that's it. Is it too? Now you've got two options. You can add the compound to the, the trim piece, or you can add it to the, the wall in the ceiling area. If you've already got finished walls and ceiling, you're probably going to want to add it to the trim. Be patient. This does not dry very fast, so you've got lots of time to work with it. All right, so now we're going to start on the corner and follow the line that I put on the wall. I'm just going to roll it in place. Okay. I'm going to put pressure on the top and the bottom just to make sure that it holds in place. There we go. Isn't that nice, eh? And like wood trim, this one you want to just use a little bit of drywall compound to do your seam now. All right. Put that in. There you go. Okay, I'm going to just wipe all that in. There we are. Pretty. Same thing holds true. You can always come back when it's dry. Take your latex window and door caulking. Put that on the bottom and the top. Get a perfect finish. Now, we're going to do the inside corner joint as well as a butt joint. I'll show you all those techniques as well. And then you'll be able to do crown in your house. So the only downside of this type of crown is because it's getting shipped to your home directly, which is not a bad thing. It only comes in eight foot lengths. Now, because it does such a great job with the joints, it doesn't really matter, but you don't want to waste any of this. So my next piece is eight foot and five eighths, five inches. So I'm just going to reuse this golf cut here and start my next row. Do, do, do.
Wow, that's the only waste. That's a pretty good deal. Here we go. Now, because I'm gonna be doing a butt, a butt joint here, I wanna just do a little trim on this, make sure that my joint is gonna be perfect. There we go. Now remember, this is an inside corner. So I actually wanna put the compound all over the inside of that corner as well. Okay. And you can be liberal here. You don't have to worry about uh, putting too much. The biggest danger here is using not enough. And we'll stick that in there. Roll the top up to close the gap. Look at that. Okay, I'm just going to clean that excess off with my finger. Now for long pieces of this trim, they're going to recommend you put some sort of temporary bracing in place. And that can be nails or screws just tapped in underneath. Or if you have some zip wall, <laughs> you can use these. These things are awesome. Done. All right, I'm going to take my sponge. I'm going to work my corner. We'll be able to come back a little bit later. Ah, perfect. And add some caulking on this at the ceiling joint so we don't get expansion cra cracks. But we'll also be able to use our latex caulking on the inside corners if you want to. But you could finish up just by taking a fingering of this mud and sliding it back up in that gap again, just like this. And that makes a really nice joint. Now that I'm happy with my corner, I'm just gonna take a screw, put it underneath my trim here, give it a little love tap. Now I can take this out and use it on my next joint. Remember, the drywall compound takes overnight to dry, so you've got all kinds of time to get around the room, roll all your corners perfect, and then tack your screws in. I just like to use the poles as I go so nothing falls on my head. So here we are, we're gonna do our inside corner. Whenever you're cutting a long piece to go into a butt joint, always do the angle first. Remember the butt joint here is gonna be on our left, but our piece is upside down. So we wanna do an inside corner and give ourselves as much material to work with as we can. Do do do. Now we're going to measure from the inside corner to the butt joint, 81 and 5 eighths. Because we're gonna be cutting it straight, we can turn it around and lay it flat. That makes it a lot easier to measure. So I did my measurement based on the tip that comes to here, but I really wanna translate that measurement to the other side, because that's where the saw will come in contact first. So I'm putting my, my square on here, making my mark. There we are. You can roll it up a little bit if you need to. All right, now I intentionally cut this about a 32nd of an inch too long. I like the idea of having just a little bit of compression to help hold it in place. Here we go. So we're gonna roll this in now. Oh, I forgot. Oh ho ho, didn't put any mud on the end the joint there. That is going to cause me problems. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And just like we did the last time. Oh, it was well done, wasn't it? I fell off my ladder, Matt. There we go. Are you okay? Yep, of course I'm okay. Fell off my ladder, didn't die. So now we want to put enough compression on these joints and position them so that they're both in the same place. There we go. That makes it seamless. Wow. Here we go. That is beautiful. Love it. Not bad, eh? Ah, 
this is one of these things where I'd never tried this product before. I'm a big fan of working with wood, right? I don't even use MDF, I just like using wood. Now it's a little messy obviously, but uh, if you're working alone, super lightweight and easy to install. Like, I'm gonna have to finish this video off with uh, coming back tomorrow to film the finished product after we've done the caulking and the, and the paint process. And you're gonna be able to see in just a few seconds how amazing this finished product looks. Wow. Okay, so it's the next day and all the mud is nice and dry. So I'm gonna use my window and door caulking to seal up all the gaps. And then after a couple of hours, that'll also be dry enough to paint. We'll come by and do our first paint application. And then we're also gonna take our sanding sponge out and just go around looking for minor imperfections that we can touch up. Because if I can see it on a ladder, then I should take care of it. Because there's a chance that I'll see it from standing on the ground. But if I can't see it on a ladder, then it doesn't exist even if it's there. <laughs> Here we go. Just uh, have a nice angle on your, the tip there. And if you're pulling this way, pointing the other way, then you can leave enough material there that you can fill it with a, a concave kind of look. There we go. All right. Well, nice and gentle here just to put that, that cove line in there. If there's too much material, then clean off your finger. You don't want to just leave it on the ceiling and make a mess. There we go. Now, once this is dry, we'll come back and we'll give it two shots of paint. And that's your opportunity after your first coat to really check to see if it's uh, enough material there or did it dry and shrink up during the process. If it shrinks up, too much. You might want to put a second bead on there because you don't want to have shadows appearing at that joint. It's really important to make sure that these little details are done really, really well because that is going to be how you're judged on the overall performance. All right, so we are going to go and paint the trim now and we're using a semi-gloss paint. And I know that I'm from Canada and y'all don't have access to Dulux. Uh, a lot of our European market does. In the United States, they're owned by the company called PPG. So they have access to the same technology paints and they're probably labeled differently. I'm not familiar with it yet. I have yet to do a road trip and discover the truth about that. But if you're looking for comparable paint companies, um, Sherwin-Williams has a really nice product and they're coast to coast all throughout North America. Um, Benjamin Moore line is nice. Some of the paints are different and they function differently, so it's kind of odd there. Um, but the most important thing to know is when you're buying paint, the quality of the paint really is reflected in the price. It's a pretty fair gamble that if you're buying paint at $20 a gallon versus $65 a gallon, you're getting value there and it's worth the investment. Um, so I would recommend, don't be afraid to spend a little money, especially on trim paint, because this is one of these areas where if you don't have a good one, you're gonna be doing three or four coats to get the coverage and it's gonna to be too thin and every brush stroke is gonna have dots of paint flying across the room. So it's really a nightmare. Feel free to buy a good quality paint here pour about an inch into the bottom of a, another container. All right, and when I say that, I mean this. You can't paint from this can when it's full because all you can do is dab the paint and then wipe it off. And there's no paint inside the brush. So with something like this, you can actually pound the bottom of that can, right? And fill up your brush. Now, when you're painting trim, you don't want to have too much paint on the outside of your brush, obviously. But I'm telling you right now, this is full of paint and I'm going to be able to go and paint four to six linear feet of my trim with that and I can carry it around with me. So I have enough paint in here to do the entire crown molding in that whole room. This is how you do it right. Okay, by the way, if you haven't seen our paint videos about the tools and stuff that we use, then you're really going to want to check that out and the link is right here. All of the gear, my ladder, all my tips and tricks are in there. And I guess we're going to have links for all of the uh, uh, locations where you can pick that material up as well. So go ahead and check that video out. It'll be a lot of help to you. Um, regarding this, I really should have done a coat on this material before I installed it. But the reality is, is it got delivered late and I was getting a little excited to get the video shot. So now I got to do two coats while I'm here. Having said that, the first coat is more of a base coat, primer coat, um, uh, just to get coverage. The second coat is the finished coat. 
And after I do this first coat, I'm going to go around and look for little minor imperfections, do a little sanding. I've got a couple of nicks here. These are actually dents from my saw guard. Um, lesson learned. And I'm also going to take the brush with the ceiling paint and do a new cut line, okay? Once I've established my line. Then the second coat, I'll come back and do a nice finished clean cut. My danger here is if I do a perfect cut with the semi-gloss now, I'm going to have this painter's caulking on the ceiling unpainted. And what that means is that over time it'll gray and it'll start getting a dark line there. So you have to make sure that when you're painting, you always paint your paintable caulking every time. The only time that you're not going to paint is if you're using pure silicone, but siliconized caulking will go gray. So I'm going to get my first coat on. I'm not going to be too picky about my cut line. I'm going to come back with the ceiling paint and then hit it again. And I'm not going to show all that whole process for you. Here we go. So a little dab will do. Pound that into the bottom of the can. Get some paint in your brush. Now look at all of that control, right? I'm not flinging paint everywhere. I'm not dripping. I don't even have a drop cloth on my new kitchen floor here. All right, there we are. I'm not painting like a wild man. I'm just trying to get that cut line in there. I'm gonna get some all over the ceiling and that's fine. After you get your first coat on, the texture of the surface gets nice and slippery and easy for the paint to glide around. While it's textured like this, you've really got to force the paint in. It's hard to do a nice cut line. So let's not be picky here. We just want to get it on, get some good coverage. Try not to get too much on the ceiling so then you don't have to do like a three inch wide swipe with the ceiling paint because that'll be noticeable. But to come back with the ceiling paint after the fact and just do a little bit of a trim line, it's not going to be an, an issue especially with all the downward light that we built into this house with the pot lights, which is one of the reasons why pot lights are so popular in the marketplace. All that down light means people aren't looking up at the ceiling and allows you a lot of freedom for imperfections. <laughs> Here we go. They aren't popular because they're sexy. They're popular because they hide problems. <laughs> Every time the builders come up with a new product, First thing you got to ask yourself is, what are they trying to hide? <laughs> because if they're not hiding something, they're not making any more money. They're not going to be bringing that product to market. Okay. Here we go. Okay, first coat. Looks pretty good. And from standing on the ground, you're probably looking at that going, oh, that's all right the way it is. But trust me when I say this, taking the time to recut the ceiling and doing a second coat and a little sanding in between, it's going to be absolutely marvelous. So here we go. It's time for the last coat of paint. Just take your sanding sponge out. Look for any issues there, like some, some dirts in there or anything like that. Sanding sponges are awesome because they'll follow the contour of the work. Make sure everything is perfectly smooth. Okay? And then same as before, push the paint in the brush. Don't want to use too much. All right? Now, no one we go. We don't have to paint that lead edge on there the second time all the way around. We just need to get a little bit on there. That's good. More importantly, it's the body of this trim detail. And you want to paint and stretch it out until your lines are gone. Okay? You don't want to leave any lines in your paint. Now, most of these paints are made with technology. Or while it's drying, it'll blend, it'll soften up. But if you leave lines in your trim paint, you're going to have lines there forever. And then it'll look really bad. So feel free. Less is more when you're working with trim paint. Just slopping on the paint will make a mess. Less is more. Just a couple in your feet at a time. Work it back and forth. Now, I don't know if the camera sees this, but there's a bunch of lines here. So maybe it's just the lighting. But I can see them because I'm standing right here. Right? And so I obviously had too much paint in my brush. I'm going to just stretch my brush out and dry it up a little bit. I'm going to come back and get rid of my lines. There we go. Okay. So the gable ends, you got to go to the store and get some hardware. These little inside corners are all you need. Little L brackets. Now, I like to always have my stickers on the inside. So if you see your sticker, you know you're on the inside. 
Well, you don't really need four of these bad boys, do you? Traditionally, these panels are designed for being installed past the hardware and the, and the rail to the wall surface. So they're actually wider than you need for an island situation. So you want to keep that in mind. You want to have this extending past the edge of the cabinet, the same depth as your doors and your drawer faces, which I have right here. Uh -huh. So I'm going to put my panel flush with the front of the cabinet and you can see there's my door. Right? This I don't want sticking past that. So I'm actually going to go to 24 and a half, so 24 and a quarter inches for these panels. Okay? So, okay, so I wrote down the width on the piece of tape for later. Once the guy for the countertop measuring has come and gone, I'm going to take this apart, cut down my width of my panel and the height of my panel. And in this case, it is one and five eighths. For the purpose of measuring, I'm going to install it here. But when I actually put it together later, I'm going to install it like this. Because I'm going to buy a 24 inch door to go on the front of this, on the front of that panel as a decorative feature. Okay? To make it look like a fake door. That way it'll line up a lot nicer. But for the purpose of measuring a counter so that we don't confuse anybody, we're going to just attach this so that we get our outside measurements for the whole counter and they don't mess that up. Now, the way we're going to do this is just take some L brackets and tape. We're going to tape these in place nice and flush and run our screws all through the tape. Mm -hmm. All right. That's why that is important. I'm using soffit screws. They're just really tiny. They're 3 8 Not designed really for the wood, but if you push hard enough, you'll make good contact and you don't come, want to come through the other side, which is the most important part of this. Remember, the other side of this panel is visible when it's all finished, so. You don't want to take a chance of screwing that up. All right, now this panel goes here. And this panel goes here. I'm just going to use a little bit of tape to hold this outside corner together. Done. You're going to start screwing. Now this seems like an awful lot of work to go through to kind of arbitrarily attach this for now. But I know these cabinet guys. And they hate taking measurements until everything is in place. The truth is they'd rather all the appliances were installed as well. But I don't care because every one of these guys does the same thing. They come out here, they'll do their measuring, and then they're going to make me sign off on it. And they're going to make me take responsibility for any of the mistakes that are made based on measurements. So if I'm going to take responsibility for it, I would rather just say, um, add the other 51 and 5 eighths that I've got measured on my wall. And I don't have to go through this nuts, but... For the purpose of the demonstration today, I'm going to show you what you're going to expect from a cabinet guy who isn't going to be very nice and play ball with you like that. Because they're most likely not going to be very friendly about you having this in the wrong place. So here we go. Now I can establish my outside corner for the end of my island. So here we are. I'm putting this in position. And I'll tell you why. A lot of these countertop guys are bringing in a laser level system and they want to have a position for the laser clips. They'll put a clip here, put a clip there, and so on. And then they'll turn on the machine and automatically detects the location of all of those clips and does all the measurements and puts it in the diagram in their computer. That's why if you don't have the outside edges established, the computer's got nothing to work with. So, I gotta use this, and I've gotta put a 5 8 something or other over there off the edge, and what I'll probably end up doing is grabbing a piece of plywood and I'll just screw it to the outside of this cabinet for now. That ought to solve that problem. And then they're gonna, the computer will automatically add the overhang. So that'll take care of it. So now I'm established. Actually, I'm ready to go because I've got 24 inches plus 24 inches plus this gable, which is actually gonna sit in between the middle. This, this actually establishes the outside dimension of my island. 
And if I'm right, all of this, I'm at 102 and a half right now. And if I add the other 5 eighths, 103 and an eighth, that's about as close as I'm going to get today. Now, when they are measuring your countertop, they're going to throw an extra inch on each side. So you have a little bit of variance, a little bit of wiggle room. The important thing is here, now that this is established, we have one last chance to make sure that we're happy with the location in the room. Not just the depth here off of these, off the back wall, but also other features like when you're walking around the outside of the island. So, one of my favorite design elements about the IKEA kitchen is that they always have these gables, right? So, we have a take a look at the drawer cabinet. You can see, you can see that's the end of the box. But then these gable elements come out and they extend past the box to encapsulate all your doors and drawers. Now they come 26 by 36, so the 24 inch cabinet, is usually when you put this on um, up against a wall, you're fine and they give it a little extra room so that you can scribe them into place. They're also amazing in an island because it can encapsulate both sides. This is why they're 26 inches. I'll just demonstrate this before we cut the height. In this scenario, I can go full extension over here for that side. And then over here, I can put a back panel on and I have enough depth left over to add a back panel and decorative doors. So if I wanted to do uh, a replication of all doors across the back of this to look like cabinets, then you can do that and you would be perfectly fine to do that. What we're doing is actually, we're gonna be doing a build out in a custom made back side of the island. So we're gonna leave the full extension on it, but I've got to measure and cut for the height. Now, the way you do that is you don't wanna cut the gable at the countertop. That's a mistake, okay? That'll be very noticeable and very ugly. So, find a surface where you can lay it down. Always stick your side up. That means this is the inside of the cabinet, okay? And generally you wanna do something like mark the top so you can keep your reference, okay? And just take your measuring tape because especially in an old house like this, nothing's ever level. You go 34, 34 and an eighth. And you measure from the top down. Use a straight line, connect the dots, and then we'll run it out to the saw. One thing to pay attention to when you're opening up your boxes, it says don't use a knife. It means down the side here, because this is the finished panel. There's not a lot of mercy there, right? But there's a little box right here. Always save the box, because this is custom sized screws for attaching the panel to the cabinets. If you go to the hardware store and you buy cabinet screws, you're gonna find them are gonna come at one and a quarter inch long. Now, get ready for this. This screw is one and an eighth, all right? And the difference is this. I'll just take this random panel here. If you were to measure and put this screw up here, let's say we're screwing from inside the cabinet. I got lots of room there, right? That looks great. If that screw was a little bit further, that's like the standard in a box is one and a quarter, you only have an eighth of an inch material left. And because this is like a high density fiber board, okay? What happens when you drive that screw in at one and a quarter, you get little raised dents in the panel. So you don't wanna have that ugly look. So make sure you set aside these screws because they are a lifesaver. Now these screws are amazing. You can use the pre-drilled holes if you like. Doesn't really matter, but I'm old school. And you just drive it until the drill says otherwise. There we go. Beautiful. So the last thing I'm gonna show you about the IKEA system is of course the baseboard. Now, if you remember, I told you at the beginning of the video, save these little weird shaped looking things. And here's why. The way this all installs, once we get rid of the packaging, this stuff here is like for model airplanes. Break it off and you can stick it on the end if you have an exposed end. But since we're using all these end panels, we don't have need of that. There we go. This system is simple. You put these in, you can rotate them and lock them in position. 
and they lock on the legs. Right? Nice and easy. All you have to do is cut the length and then the height. Now there's two sides to this. One end has a little rubber gasket here and it's designed to keep water from getting under the counter when you wash your floors. And the other side is designed for easy cutting so you can cut the height. Remember the legs for these counters are adjustable so you might have a situation like I do in my old house where you have to scribe a little bit the detail on this. But that's no big deal. Now for the purpose of our education today, I went ahead and I prepped this one up for us. Okay, and I'll show you how easy it is to snap these things in place. Hey, ah. we'll just get down into position here. So remember when we put the feet together, we have these adjustable discs that slide up and down. And we're gonna put these down now near the bottom. And what that does is it sets a depth the same as the ring, okay, that sets. So this will end up square when you push it all together. Oh, there we go. Now we gotta get that in there. And all we do is slide it in place. There we go and snap it on. Ah, baseboards. <laughs> now the, the feature here that we're gonna talk about just for a couple minutes, give you an idea. Unfortunately, we weren't able to film on the day that this went in. This is life, right? And huge renovation project going on here. But what it is is a barn board. It's bought from a design store. Comes in two different widths, okay? What they've done is they've taken these old boards and they've sliced them right down the middle. So they're only half an inch thick. And then all you have to do to install this stuff is really a few stages. One, you want to paint the surface behind it. It comes with imperfections and knot holes and little angles and chips missing. And if you paint a nice dark brown or a dark gray or something like that, then when you install this board and you look at the wall, you aren't going to see the wall board behind it or whatever surface it is. Like on this particular part, I've got gray cabinet on one side from Ikea and the other side is an OSB panel. And I didn't want two different knot holes showing that there's a different back on each side. It looks stupid. So we paint it. And then when we let the paint dry, the way we install this, use a laser level, set up your line. Okay. Install your first row using a 23 gauge nailer, not an 18 gauge nailer. It's called a pin nailer. And the holes in the surface of this wood are so small, you can't even find them if you look for them. The reason for that is this. We're using PL Premium adhesive strips, setting the wood into the glue, and then just throwing a couple of pins on to hold it in place until it dries. That's it. And this is just solid as a rock. It's not going to go anywhere. It looks great, and it's an awesome way to add texture and color and design to a relatively simple room like this kitchen. Well, hopefully this video was long enough that you might have learned something new. And if you did, that's awesome. Hit the like button. Don't forget to check out our playlist of all of our A to Z videos. You can learn all the other trades that we teach on this channel. We'll see you then.